Uh, we are very honored to have uh, a very distinguished guest who is all about humility and humbleness, if you get to know her. And I encourage you all to get to uh, meet our uh, uh, speaker for today, uh, Sandra de Castro Buffington. My paths crossed with Sandra at the University of Spoiled Children, <laughs> USC, in 1989, when Sandra, who at that time worked with USAID, no, okay, Johns Hopkins University, was in essence uh, uh, the lead from Johns Hopkins University collaborating with some of us at USC to enable the first international conference on entertainment, education, and social change. And that happened to be um, an area of work that I have pursued professionally, and uh, which Sandra has actually supported and funded from her big offices in Washington, DC. Uh, you can read a lot about Sandra and her bio. Some of you may have access to it because we did send it out. I'll just say that at the present time, Sandra is the director of the Hollywood Health and Society program, which is located at the University of Southern California's Annenberg Schools Norman Lear Center. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. And uh, she'll tell us about the work that the Hollywood Health and Society program does in Hollywood, but not just in Hollywood, because Hollywood is Hollywood planet. No? And so the issues that they tackle in Hollywood, when a storyline gets on Bold and the Beautiful and it deals with HIV AIDS, it is watched in about 150 countries on any given day by about 450 to 500 million people every single day. So the implications for the portrayal of accurate health information to reach that kind of an audience in one go with one show, and you work with multiple shows at one time, you can just imagine uh, if we are in a program of communication, the implications it can have. Uh, Sandra, what was the total value of the health communication programming portfolio that you managed on a yearly basis? So Sandra was in charge of $100 million mm, uh, of health communication programming at USAID, and the portfolio was global. It was global. Mm. So uh, in essence, we are very fortunate to have a person who has worked uh, not just as a funder, donor, but somebody who's been involved in issues of policy making and program decision making in Washington, but with, of course, implications for global public health. Hmm? And uh, all this amounts to say uh, that Sandra is, you know, a very uh, experienced, uh, a global citizen and very well versed in the power of the media and the power of what we all are engaged in and interested in uh, to improve the quality of lives of people. So would you please join me in welcoming Sandra de Castro Buffington to UTEP. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be holding this. Yes or no? No. I didn't think so. So. Oh, and I'm, I've been saying that. The Department of Communication, uh, you know, just about to uh, <laughs> plug myself in. <laughs> now, is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Well, first I'd like to thank Arvind and the organizers of this social justice dialogue series for the opportunity to be here with you today. It's really a privilege. I had no idea that we had a small Bhutan here on the border of the US and Mexico. It's such an amazing convergence of cultures and it's really a privilege to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is talk with you about Hollywood Health and Society today. But before we start, 
uh, for those of you who weren't in the class last night, I'd like to ask you, what do you think of when you think of entertainment? What words come to mind? Entertainment is, just a word. Celebrity. <clears throat> Celebrity. Pastime. Enjoyment. Pastime, enjoyment. Empowering. Empowering. Relaxation. Relaxation. Eye candy. Eye candy. Eye candy's okay, it has many words as you want. What else? Um, fun. Fun. Okay. Movies. Movies. Okay, it's great. So there are many words that come to mind when we think of television and of entertainment. But I'm going to ask you to think of entertainment differently. To think of it not just as a leisure activity, but as the way that messages grab and hold our attention. And think of it not just as a sector of the economy, but as a driving force, maybe the driving force of daily life today. And you can think of politics, religion, education, commerce, the arts. Today, there is scarcely a domain of human existence unaffected by the battle for eyeballs, the need to stimulate, to entertain, to play with us, to tell us stories. The stakes for society are enormous. And that's why we work with entertainment education. And this is a definition that comes from a very important book written by your professor, Arvin Singal, and our, our colleague, <laughs> our colleague, Ev Rogers, who we loved very much. Um, and it's really the process of purposefully designing and implementing a media message that both entertains and educates. And we know that this can change knowledge, attitudes, and behavior, and it can shift social norms. And there are many forms of entertainment education. This is not new. It's often driven from the bottom up, from the grassroots to treetops. And it has been used for political and social change, which has impacted health over the years. And I'm sure you recognize Martin Luther King, but do you recognize the woman on the right? For those of you who weren't there yesterday. Is anybody? Leading figure in health worldwide. This is Margaret Sanger, and she was the founder of the birth control or contraceptive movement. Very controversial, um, and I, I'm going to read you this quote from H.G. Wells. Um, actually, I didn't bring it today. This is a different one. Um, but there was fierce opposition to her ideas, but she gradually won support, and obviously contraception and birth control has become available worldwide. So one of the other things we know <coughs> is that television is a very important channel for entertainment education. And from the health style survey data, we know that 58% of primetime viewers and 67% of daytime viewers report learning something new about a disease or how to prevent it from scripted television shows. And one third of them take action on what they've learned. And that makes our responsibility at Hollywood Health and Society really uh, important to get accurate health content into TV storylines. Now we know from this media usage chart, and you look at the bars on the far left, that television use is on the rise. Even with the advent of new media, we know that people are continuing to watch television and even more so. We also know that people are multitasking, and I'll get into that later in this talk. So Hollywood Health and Society harnesses the power of the entertainment media to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. So let's look at an example. How does this work? How many people here have seen Grey's Anatomy? Okay. So it's a very popular show. According to Nielsen ratings, it's one of the top shows in the US. So I'm going to show you a short clip. Um, this was a piece. Um, on mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Um, the F Kaiser Family Foundation consulted on this part of the storyline, and Hollywood Health and Society consulted on other aspects of this episode. So let's take a look. Sorry. Can we turn the lights on? So long. Congratulations, you're pregnant. 
You're sure? It's a big day for pregnant ladies. Pregnant ladies have a right turn. It's weird. So I'm only supposed to give you a couple of these, but this is like a month's supply of prenatal vitamin samples. They're free. No, I... We need to schedule an abortion. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I don't mean to intrude, but... You might want to sit with this for a few days before you make your decision. So, there's no decision to make. I'm HIV positive. I knew it. You disapprove. You're here to push some kind of agenda, right? No. No. Listen, if you want to have an abortion because you want to have an abortion, then that's between you and whatever God you believe in. But if you want to have an abortion because you think that's what medicine is telling you to do, then that's between you and me. I was ineffectual. It was unclear. I've been on my heels a little bit lately, and I was unclear, so just listen, okay? I wasn't telling you there is some chance your baby might not be born sick. I was telling you there is a 98% chance your baby could be born perfectly healthy. A 98% chance. There's a higher chance of your baby being born with Down syndrome than there is of you passing HIV onto your child. I don't... I just... I, I can't... I know you gave up on having children a long time ago. I understand that it's difficult to readjust your thinking so quickly, but Sarah, if you take your meds responsibly, there's no reason why you can't have a beautiful, healthy baby. This is your chance, if you want it. This is your chance to be a mom. 98% chance. 98% chance. So this episode reached 17.5 million viewers in a single hour in this country alone. And Kaiser Family Foundation <coughs> supported a study. It was three random telephone surveys of 1,500 regular viewers. So they, they did um, interviews one week before the storyline aired. And they did one a week after it aired and then six weeks later. And so I'm going to look at just one finding, which was the answer to this question. As far as you know, if a woman who is HIV positive becomes pregnant and receives the proper treatment, what is the chance that she will give birth to a healthy baby, that is, a baby who is not infected with HIV? Before the episode aired, only 15% of respondents got the answer right. One week after the episode aired, 61% of viewers got the answer right. And then six weeks later, there was a drop off to 45%. That's still from before the episode to six weeks later, a threefold increase in viewers who got the answer right. Or you could look at it as a 300% increase. And so if you do the math with 17.5 million viewers, that means that 8 million people learned from this episode for the first time that there is a way for an HIV positive woman to have a baby and have a healthy baby. By any measure, that's a success. Um, we know that this information can have a big impact on public awareness, and we also, also know that repetition of the information is important. So Hollywood Health and Society's objectives are to increase the accuracy of TV health content and to educate TV writers about health issues. We serve as a credible resource of information to TV writers. I'm going to get into our model in a minute, but what I want to be really clear about is that we don't tell writers what to write. And for those of you who have been around Hollywood, they would never work with us if we tried to tell them what to write because um, Hollywood script writers are masterful storytellers. They're masterful storytellers. So we wouldn't tell them how to tell a story. What we do is serve as a support to them to provide accurate information so that when they're talking about health, they'll talk about it accurately. We've been funded for eight years now by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
We also have funding from the California Endowment, and that's a private health foundation in California. They support us in, you know, for the most part when people talk about health, they think about smart choices. People equate health with individual risk and behavior. If I minimize my risk and I make smart choices about what I eat, my exercise, and what I do, I'll be healthy. But actually, there's another very important factor, and that's the environment, or the way that space and place impact our health. So we could tell women, tell mothers, for example, get your kids out to the park every day to exercise and make sure to feed them healthy foods. But if they live in neighborhoods where there's, there's no fresh produce, there are only liquor stores, and they're in a neighborhood where it's unsafe to send a child out to play, you're not going to get a healthy child. So we have to deal with the social determinants. And then think about the challenges of getting writers to portray space and place or the environment in TV storylines. That's a challenge. OK, we also have funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they support <coughs> us in focusing on global health topics. So we're working with US script writers. And we're finding ways to inspire them to address global health. Many times, these are, these are writers who have never traveled to Africa or to Asia. So they've never been immersed in other cultures. And so we're working to create an environment that inspires and informs them so that they'll include global health topics in the TV storylines. We also have funding from two other government agencies under HRSA, and that's the Division of Organ Transplantation. You can imagine there's a lot of good drama that comes out of organ transplant. Um, and also the Poison Control Program, also good for dramatic storylines. So what I want to go to now is a clip from, um, I think that's what it's going to be, a clip from The Bold and the Beautiful. This is a daytime soap opera. As Arvind said, these soaps have very wide reach. They're aired in 200 countries around the world. Um, Hollywood Health and Society took uh, two experts from the CDC to talk with the writers of The Bold and the Beautiful about HIV and AIDS. So listen for the key messages on uh, reducing stigma around HIV and AIDS and on heterosexual transmission of the virus. There's a long lead in, so I have to keep talking. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, daytime soaps. Here we go. No, you are HIV positive. Turn it down. Is it too loud? positive is no longer a death sentence to me. With a daily regimen of proteins, inhibitors, and other antiviral medications, you can live with this disease. Live with it? And what kind of life am I going to have? People with HIV can live very, very normal lives. Normal lives. I'm not normal! I'm sick! I got the most terrifying, horrible news I've ever heard of in my life. From who? From a doctor. Ellen's doctor? My doctor. I'm sick, Kristen. What do you mean you're sick? The doctor gave me a blood test and uh, it came back positive. For what? For Tony. What was the test for? I 
And that's what we wanted to talk to you about. What we can do. Well, as you know, this isn't an exact science. So I'm going to tell you my views. And personally, I'd rather err on the side of caution. One of the ways HIV is transmitted is through blood. Tony's blood is infected. If it comes into contact with your blood, Kristen, you could become HIV positive yourself. Blood? What about other bodily fluids? Your semen carries the same risk. Your saliva does not. So we can kiss? Oh, yes, of course. But please keep in mind, if you have any open sores in your mouth, cold sores, breathing gums, and absolutely not, even something as innocent as kissing can bring you into contact with each other's blood. And that's what you have to avoid at all costs. Kristen. I love you. Yes. I want you to be my wife. <laughs> All of these kids are orphaned by age. Millions more. Well, they might not be willing to tell you that. Sunday told us his parents were in a car crash. You have to understand the fear. These children have dealt with so much rejection in their short lives. So what really happened to him? He watched his mother die. He had been taking care of her and his little brother himself, going from door to door, begging for food. His little brother? He had AIDS too? Yes. We got back to Los Angeles and we missed you. We missed you so much. And we figured since you're living here without any parents, and we're living there without any children, it made us sad. So we decided that, um, that you could come live with us and be our son. So, um, Hollywood Health and Society developed a public service announcement, a PSA. It was aired the first time on August 3rd, if you look at the two red arrows. Um, it featured Tony, the lead character, referring people to a <coughs> CDC AIDS hotline call-in number. So it was aired first on August 3rd, which was the day Tony learned he was HIV positive. <coughs> and the second time it aired was on August 13th, another dramatic plot point, the day Tony told his fiance he was HIV positive. So if you look at this, um, it resulted in the highest peak in callers all year on August 13th, 5,313 calls in a single day. Now what we did is tracked all of the calls to the hotline over 12 months. So anytime this hotline was mentioned in the media, we plotted it on this graph. So there was a 60 minutes episode about um, HIV AIDS referring people to call. There was a Surgeon General PSA that aired. There was an MTV special, very hip and cool, appealing to young people. And then there was a great big national HIV AIDS get testing campaign that was very highly financed. And it was the second highest peak, but it didn't reach the level of August 13th, bold and beautiful. So I have a question for you. If you look at August 3rd and August 13th, they're both dramatic plot points in the storyline. Tony learns he's HIV positive on the 3rd. He tells his fiance on the 13th. Why were there so many more callers on the 13th? Because people could relate with the experience and they were urged within just to call. Okay, that's give a good. Gave people more confidence. Gave them more confidence? Those people probably were in relationships themselves. Like like if I were in a relationship with someone and someone was on the episode revealing to their partner that they had HIV, I would want to know if I have a partner too. Exactly. Okay, so my question is, who was watching the soap? Daytime soaps. Everybody. Well, women. 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 So women are watching this show. The calls came on August 13th, the day, as you said, there was a relationship and the man tells the woman he's HIV positive. So there we go. So what that tells us 
it demonstrates that TV viewers can be moved to seek more information about health topics when a PSA is tied to a dramatic plot point in a storyline, and also when there are characters they relate to. So that's a really important piece of this. <coughs> so how do we do this? You know, Hollywood Health and Society has a model. You know, as you can imagine, every single issue advocacy group in the world wants to work with Hollywood writers because everybody wants to get their issue onto a TV show because it has such wide reach and huge impact. Our model is the flip side. Our model is actually the opposite of a traditional public health campaign. So for those of you who are involved in communications, in a traditional outreach campaign, you're designing a campaign around key messages. You produce or co-produce a campaign and you have control from beginning to end and you know what your end products are going to look like. In our model, we have no control over the end product. We aren't producing or co-producing anything. We don't tell the writers what to write. So what do we do? We conduct outreach. So we do expert briefings and, and consultations with writers. We actually take health experts to the writers' rooms. We go right into the writers' rooms. There might be 20 network executives and writers around a table, or there might be three. But we take an expert, we spend one hour, and this expert talks about a health topic. We prepare them to tell case studies, real stories of real people, because that's what writers are looking for. They want to know what's really happening in the world. And then they take off from there, and they spin their story from a real case study. We also provide um, tip sheets. And what I always ask uh, our experts before we go into the writer's room, if you could reach, and you could all ask yourselves this, because I'm sure you're all experts in some area or you're passionate about a, a certain area. If you could reach 20 million people in one hour with three messages about what you care about, what would they be? What would those messages be? And that's what we challenge our experts with. Come up with three to five key messages. And once we have that from the writers and we help them phrase them, we capture them and put them in a tip sheet and we also add a lot of other data about that topic, facts. And this tip sheet goes into a folder. So we have these blue folders with a whole lot of background information on our program, but also on the topic at hand, the bio of the expert, the tip sheets, and some articles usually that the expert has authored or has recommended. Every single writer in that room walks out with this packet. So it's almost like the memory of the briefing in their hand. We also have a lot of resources online. So this is kind of how we work. Some of the shows brainstorm with us. They're very transparent about their creative process. They involve us in that. Other shows, total opposite. They won't even crack a smile. We'll sit there for an hour, total deadpan. They don't want us to know whether they like it or they don't. They do ask a lot of questions, and they have people recording everything that's said. But they don't want to give away what might show up on next week's episode of ER or Grey's Anatomy. So it's, it's different. We also respond to inquiries. Uh, when writers are writing about a topic, and we don't work just with the, the health shows. We work with all the crime shows. We work with children's programming. We work with Spanish language telenovela. You name it, if it's in Nielsen's ratings, we've worked with them. And they call us seven days a week. I have staff with Blackberries taking calls nights and weekends because writers often have very short deadlines. And they'll get to a point and they'll call us and say, we need a pediatric geneticist in two hours. And we have a huge database of experts, and we hook them up. We facilitate a phone conversation, or we do this by email. We never leave them alone together. We always facilitate, because that ensures that it goes well. Um, yeah. We have other forms of um, outreach. We have panel discussions. We, um, Hollywood Health and Society has a partnership with the Writers Guild of America West. And I'm sure you've heard of the Writers Guild and the Writers Strike last year that lasted 100 days. So we hold our panel discussions there. Um, we also have an annual award ceremony, the Sentinel for Health Awards, to recognize exemplary health storylines in television. And we had six categories this year. We had primetime drama, daytime drama, primetime comedy, Spanish language telenovela, and children's programming. And we also had minor storyline and major storyline. So we gave out 13 awards. 
we also evaluate the impact of our programs, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. So let's take a look at another example. Has anybody here not seen the show House? Okay. So for those of you who haven't seen it, um, this is a medical mystery show. Um, the creator of the show is a lawyer, and so he designed a medical show like a crime show, only in this case, the culprit is the germ or the cause of the disease. And so it's a process of elimination, of trying to you know, get down to the cause so then there can be a cure and you can save the patient. Um, so let's take a look at this clip. How old are you? 30. Have you ever seen an after school special? Dawson's Creek? And you get to 30 and not know about condoms. Oh, God, I have an STD. No, but you will. Every patient who comes in here for an STD test has one thing in common. They had SWS, sex while stupid. How old are you? 16. <laughs> You're lying. That's not the point. You've never seen Dawson's Creek. <laughs> and you've never seen an after school special. How do you look to your age and not know about condoms? I have an STD. Yeah. You're actually the first one today. Lucky day. Well, not for you, but you gotta feel good for everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> it's chlamydia. As bad news goes, it's about the best. <laughs> oh, settle down. It's treatable. It's actually curable. shows can deal with some very serious issues. So last season, Hollywood Health and Society placed over 140 um, informational links. For some reason, this didn't work. Yeah. Informational links to the House website. What we do is actually we, we post tip sheets with links embedded in them to credible sources of information. And what we wanted to know was, you know, we wanted to know about the health-seeking behavior for further information triggered by the shows. So we looked at the CDC topics. These are uh, topics that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are interested in with the highest number of web hits because we refer people to their websites. And the, these were the five top topics of which four are sexual and reproductive health topics like the episode, the clip you saw from the episode on House. So what we looked at here, um, okay, uh, we were looking at, so if you look at day zero, day zero is when House airs the episode. They don't let us post the web link until day one because, if, because it's a medical mystery, if we were to post the web link on day zero, and people were to see it ahead of time, it would blow the mystery. So they won't let us reveal that. So we post on day one. You see these huge peaks in search, web hits to these websites on day one, and then seven days later, a smaller peak, but still a peak, and again seven days later. So what we know is people go back to the website each week, and they're seeing our links up there, even though it's not related to the current show, and people are searching <coughs> for further information. Then we wanted to know about the timing of search behavior. So rather than looking at just the CDC websites, what we did is looked at search engine data. So people during the episodes use Google or Yahoo, some other search engine, and start looking for um, information on, in this case, the red peak is chlamydia, and the blue one is bacterial vaginosis. And if you look at this chart, they were searching between 9 and 10 p.m. Well, that's exactly when the show airs. What that tells us 
is that people are multitasking. They're, watching, they're not waiting until this episode's over. They're already online going, whoa, I have these symptoms too. I want to know more about this. So now we're going to go to another topic. Um, I don't know if anybody here recognizes. This is Dr. Atul Gawande. Um, Atul Gawande is a Harvard-trained surgeon. Um, he is very well known for a number of reasons. One is a physician. The other is that he's a full-time writer, staff writer with The New Yorker. And he has two best-selling books, top 10 of Amazon.com. Um, and he also happens to work with the World Health Organization. Well, Hollywood Health and Society is very interested in world health and global health. We've got funding from Gates. Our mission is to get global health topics into TV storylines. So we got in touch with Atul Gawande, who is working with World Health Organization on something called the Safer Surgical Checklist. This is the checklist. It's very simple. It's just one little sheet with a few little items, um, and they're promoting its use before surgery starts. It takes two minutes, very low tech, pull a little piece of paper out of the pocket, read off, and it starts with asking the patient the patient's name and why they're there. Now they're lying, they're ready to be knocked out, but they're not knocked out yet. Then they go around and introduce each other. Everybody in that operating suite introduces themselves by name and by uh, function, what they're there for. And things like that. Have they started the IV? Well, what, what the data show is that the use of this checklist can reduce infections and complications due to surgery by 50% around the world. So we brought in, and apparently there's, our, there's huge resistance on the part of many physicians to using this simple tool because they've been so highly trained, they probably don't need it, but actually the world does need it. So a tool uh, came to do some briefings for us, and we took him to meet with the writers of ER and with the writers of Law and Order SVU, Special Victims Unit. We're going to focus on ER. He did the most wonderful briefing. The writers loved him. It went very well. And they told us as we left that they would incorporate this safer surgical checklist into an episode. But I didn't know exactly when or how prominent it would be. So this episode aired on March 12th. Was that a week or two, two weeks ago? A week ago? Yeah. And this was the big, did anybody here see the March 12th episode when George Clooney returned? Two people in the back, and uh, Juliana uh, Margolis, is that right? And some others all came back to the show. So let's take a look. We have a visitor. No, I remember being asked if Dr. Benton could scrub in for this. I'm a friend of the patient. He asked if I would serve. Uh huh. Put him under. Let's do this. Whoa, whoa. What about the checklist? Excuse me. Safe surgery checklist. I've had 10 cases a day, Doctor. All the more reason to take the necessary precautions. It only took a minute. One minute. John Carter here for a right cadaveric renal allograft. Does the patient have a known allergy? No. Does anesthesia anticipate a difficulty already? No. Is the risk of bleeding greater than 500 cc's? I sure as hell hope not. Let's go put him on there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody slow down. Now let's just... Take that time and introduce the room. What's next? We all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Sheila Lane, Scrub Nurse. Paula Cheney, Circulating Nurse. Kate Schumacher, Anesthesiologist. Randall Ogerman, Chief Surgical Resident. Ethan Dean, Surgical Intern. Peter Benton, Observing General Surgeon. Any concerns from the surgical team? Oh, my God, you're wasting my time. Any nursing concerns? We don't have any reperfusion solution. We won't be needing it. I'll have some, so not. Were any antibiotics given in the last 60 minutes? Just starting them now. Ten blade. Hold on, hold on. If you run any antibiotics prior to incision, you cut the risk of infection by half. Dr. Benton, you're a guest here, and I don't like guests. As a friend of the patient, you're welcome to sit, observe, and shut up. Ten blade. A donor left atrium to the native arterial cuff. Arterial and venous anastomosis are complete. Releasing the clamp. Suture lines look good, no leaks. I don't think he has pretty order. Shouldn't it be picking up by now? What happened to sitting quietly in the corner, Dr. Benton? No, seriously, shouldn't it be? Sometimes it takes a minute. I don't have a break, 
This episode has had such repercussions around the world, it's really amazing. You know, you don't think about physicians actually watching these shows and learning from them. Well, they do. They do. They both watch and they learn. So uh, this show had aired on a Thursday night. The next morning at 6 a.m., there was a meeting of surgeons in a hospital in New York, 150 surgeons. And the reason <coughs> I know this is a friend of O'Toole's <coughs> sent him an email, and he forwarded it to me. And the agenda for this uh, surgical group's meeting was to watch a film on safe surgery and have a discussion. So all 150 surgeons were there. They were forced to watch the entire episode of ER, and afterwards they had a discussion about how to use the safer surgical checklist in their orthopedics practice. So it really does. And I have to tell you, the day before I, I, I flew to El Paso, which was two days ago, I got an email from France from the man who is the head of the um, quality of care and quality assurance program for the country. And there had been some news coverage of this episode, and I had been interviewed, and that's how he found me. And he wrote to me in this wonderful English, which was kind of, you know, his obviously second or third or fifth language, asking me how he could get a clip of this piece of, of the episode so that he could use it for teaching purposes nationally in France. So these shows really do have impact. So I just, um, this was the story I just told you. Um, so we'll look over that now. This one, okay, so we're staying with the global health theme. Um, we did a briefing with Law and Order SVU on a different topic that had to do with HIV deniers in Africa. And this is based on a true story about the president of Gambia and the former minister of health of South Africa, who both denied they didn't believe that HIV caused AIDS. And so Law & Order, Neil Bear is the executive producer of Law & Order SVU, and he's also the co-chair of Hollywood Health & Society's board. So we have a very close relationship with him. And he's very committed to global health. He has a program in Mozambique. He works with AIDS orphans. He gives them cameras and teaches them how to both shoot film, produce their own documentaries, and to take stills. But anyway, so back to this show. You'll see, um, listen for the talking points, the messages on the same one you saw on Grey's Anatomy about preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV. It's called Retro. This is a man of kids. What's happened to her is a crime. Kids only get this sick when they're not treated. They're treated for what? HIV. She has AIDS. Yeah. Advanced. And her parents didn't do a damn thing about it. How oh, well we checked your baby's DNA and it matches her. So what do you say? Why'd you lie to corrections and say you didn't have a child? Because I didn't want social services to find out about her. They take your baby when you're high. So I had her at home and never got a birth certificate. You tell the father? I don't know who he is. She's a trick baby, but that doesn't mean that I don't love her. And why are you here? Is Antonia okay? Well, she's in the hospital with AIDS. Which means you're HIV positive. But I quit using when I was pregnant. I did everything I could to keep her clean. Except taking antiretrovirals before she was born. 
which could have prevented this from happening. But I never meant to hurt my little girl. Angela? Police? What's this about? They are here to see me again. Our green cards have expired. We were afraid we would be sent back to Gambia. We didn't know what to do. Antonia just got sicker and sicker. When the mother went he to jail, she the gave her baby to this no. couple, her neighbors, to take care of. Her to die. And it, and we loved her like she was our own. Everything was fine until she stopped eating. We thought she missed her mother. Then I saw the white spots in her mouth, and I knew it was AIDS. How? Many people have died in my country. I raised my sister, and she had the same sickness. So you knew how sick Antonia was. Why didn't you bring her to the hospital? Because the AIDS medicines are poison. Who told you that? Our president. Matthias found a cure. He rubs a green paste of herbs on his patient's chest. Hold on. The president of Gambia does this himself? Every Thursday. And then he gives them the bitter yellow brew and two bananas. And they're cured. Did you try to cure Antonia? No. The president's recipe is secret. So we went on the internet and found a doctor who believes as we do. He gave Antonia vitamins, but she just got worse. Okay, this doctor, what's his name? I also instructed the morons to get rid of yogurt. Yogurt for AIDS? Are you out of your mind? Not every patient with HIV needs medication. Antonia Suarez presented with a minor case of thrush, and I chose an alternative treatment, which has worked very well. Well enough that she nearly died from it. And then, as I instructed the Marons, they should have come back for more therapy. Like what? Pudding? No. Antifungal medication, as any medical professional would prescribe. Now, a medical professional would have given the child its HIV-positive medicine on the first visit. You're a quack. We're through. How many people have you cured with vitamins and yogurt? I have patients waiting. Can I help them? Want to see some Hocus Pocus? Check out Dr. Demento's website. Truth about HIV. There's no proof that HIV causes AIDS. The anti-HIV medications Big Pharma makes will kill you. This guy is a fruitcake. According to Hutton, AIDS is a global conspiracy funded by pharmaceutical companies to make big bucks. And commit genocide. My parents believe the government created HIV in a lab, and the CIA spread it in the prisons to kill blacks and gays. How does a doctor believe this crap? He's an AIDS denier, part of a misguided minority who believes that HIV doesn't cause AIDS, and that AIDS itself doesn't exist. Two-thirds of the world's HIV-positive kids get infected during pregnancy or at birth from the mother. The rest acquire it during breastfeeding. Okay, so Susan could have passed the virus to Lisa either way. It's a shame. HIV positive women in this country have a 98% chance of having a healthy baby if they take antiretrovirals during pregnancy and put the child on meds after birth. Which Susan probably didn't do because she thinks HIV is harmful. She put Lisa's life in danger by breastfeeding her and by withholding medication when Lisa got sick. And since any reasonable person knows HIV causes AIDS, that's criminally negligent homicide. Okay. So. We wanted to learn about the impact on viewers. One of the things we're looking at is um, we're looking at how viewers prioritize global issues. For example, we, construct, we constructed an index to look at whether people prioritize global health or if they would choose defense. I mean, there are a lot of different global priorities. And what we found, and this we did a pretest before the story aired, a week before it aired, and we did a test a week after the storyline aired. And we found that this storyline increased knowledge of HIV <coughs> among those who had never been tested for HIV and AIDS. It increased awareness of AIDS deniers for females. And, the, and the, we found an association between HIV knowledge and increased global health priorities for females. So, because our grant goes for three years, and we're hoping that we'll get a lot of, uh, at least four global health storylines per year, we're going to keep repeating this type of research to see if with multiple exposures there is an increasing uh, prioritization of global health um, among viewers. That's what we're looking at. 
Okay, so um, the Hollywood Health and Society has a TV monitoring project. And I met with some students today at lunch. We talked about this. Um, we actually train graduate students in how to code. Like, we actually pay them to watch television. They think this is the best job they've ever had in their lives. And we look at the top 10 to 20 scripted shows. Um, let me show you. So these are the top shows according to Nielsen's ratings uh, from 2006. And Nielsen ratings divides viewers into general audience, African American, and Hispanic viewers. And these are the top, the most popular shows among those three audiences. The boxes in white are the ones they have in common. So those are the, the ones shared across the three uh, groups of viewers. The ones in purple are the ones that are unique to those viewing groups, okay? So what we code for are about 70 different health topics. So our students watch the episode once through, and then they watch again with a whole stack of coding sheets. And so they're, they're looking at, you know, do they talk about HIV? Do they talk about diabetes? Do they talk about prevention? Do they talk about diagnosis and treatment? Was there educational value? There are all these ways that they're trained to evaluate. It's like doing a health map of what kind of health we're seeing on TV. So we've recently added codes for um, the region of the world, for international topics, for the social determinants of health. These are things we hadn't coded for before. And we just did an analysis, a baseline analysis, of how much global health or international health are we seeing in these top scripted shows and TV. And if you look at this for the general audience category, only 1% of the episodes dealt with international health topics. Things like HIV and AIDS, TB, malaria, polio, maternal and child health, uh, tobacco cessation, those kinds of topics. And less than 1% of the health storylines within the episodes watched by all audiences included any international aspect to them. The good news is within the 1% of storylines that had an international aspect to them, the educational content was moderate to strong in 38% of these episodes. So what that tells us is there's a lot of room for growth. We have our work cut out for us to actually get more global health topics into TV storylines. But the good news is if we're successful in doing that, we have a very good chance of having a higher level of educational value to those storylines. Um, this was just a question about cultural background of characters in these storylines. You know, a Nielsen rating divides these th into three groups. And we know that television is a primary source of health information for a lot of Americans, actually 26%. Um, the heaviest consumers of TV, African Americans and Hispanics, are at disproportionate health risk and the research suge suggests that we tend to pay greater attention to, identify with, and emulate those who we perceive as similar to us. So some of the conclusions from evaluations we've done on these storylines is that regular viewers learn from TV health storylines and they talk about the storyline and the health topics they see. And that viewers will seek more information when, with hotline numbers or informational web links when they're linked to dramatic storylines. And we know that when health storylines are accurate, they can help to dispel myths and to promote health. And we know that viewers who identify more strongly with a character may have a stronger response. And we also know that sexual and reproductive health are very popular topics. This is, these are some shots from our um, Sentinel for Health Awards ceremony this year. We held it in early October. Um, and we have several rounds of judging. We collect the entries, then we go to the CDC, and we group all of these TV episodes into categories. Mental health, um, children's health, you know, reproductive health. And we have experts in those topics, subject matter experts, do a round of judging. We have all these criteria. And the winners of that first round, the ones that have the best technical content, go to the second round of judging. And that round is done in Hollywood. 
And in the second round, we're evaluating for entertainment value. And so the winners are the ones that have the best technical content and the best entertainment value. And so we gave out 13 awards this year. What I'm, I'm just going to mention, I didn't include any slides in this today because I, I talked about it yesterday in the class, is that Hollywood Health and Society is expanding globally. Um, we were invited by the UN, it's actually UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, to travel to the Middle East. So I went to Oman and then a couple of months later to Egypt. And I had a chance to meet with people from about 15 different Arab countries and Balkan states. And um, I presented the Hollywood Health and Society model, and they've asked us to set up a center for entertainment education for the Middle East so that they can learn how to work with Arabic language programming to get accurate health content and other <coughs> messages of social value about <coughs> climate change, environmental health, uh, you know, peace building, conflict resolution, really any social issue into their entertainment media. So we know that at EE saves lives, improves health, and enhances well-being globally. So thank you. Let's uh, do about five minutes uh, worth of uh, formal Q&A. And after that, uh, those who you know who have things to do or uh, can you know can yeah do their things, and then uh, the informal conversations may continue hmm, after that. So uh, Sandra is uh, willing and open to fielding questions or taking comments. I know a lot of the shows were on cable, general audience. How are you guys working with the regular cable? Shows. We we work primarily with network television, but we do work with some of the cable shows. So it's really a combination. And we work primarily with scripted television. We aren't working with reality right now because our focus has been with writers. We're giving lots of in-depth, you know, health information and not have a result. And with television, you know, the turnaround time is very short. You know, we can see an episode in two months on the screen. Sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes they sort of file away an interesting topic and it doesn't show up for two years. But we just have a much better turnaround with television. Well, the reason I ask about film is because everyone always refers to a movie like one scene, like let's say like Rambo or like right. Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's like, if I jump off this building, I can survive. <laughs> and it's like, let's say like one of the horrible scenes in a hospital, and it's like, probably stab myself and I'll survive or something like that. And it's like, most of the kids will watch it and they'll think those things and it's like, it's horrible. Right. <laughs> That's why. So it makes it entertaining. That's why it makes it entertaining. <laughs> but. You're right. And so I guess the answer is there is a lot of value to working with filmmakers as well. Um, but we're, we do that very selectively just because it's very time consuming. Because you get um, funding <coughs> from the CDC and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, like, et cetera, like when you provide and you go to these script writers and you bring this specialist in, is it a service you provide or is it like, okay, we're coming, but right? you need your check ready. We'll get you there. <laughs> <laughs> or the it's packet, like, like, how does that work? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so, Hollywood Health and Society has this independent funding. We're a nonprofit organization, part of USC, the Norman Lear Center. We take no money from Hollywood. Even if they want to throw it at us, you'd be surprised. People want to, pharma companies want to give us money, single issue advocacy groups, everybody wants to give us money because they want access to the writers. We're such a clean machine. We will never take a dime from any kind of special interest group or from our clients the writers or the or Hollywood we just don't that keeps us independent the other thing is we take no credit for our work we ne you'll never see Hollywood Health and Society on credits we don't compete with the writers or Hollywood uh, for anything we're simply a support mechanism we're a resource to them that's what allows them to come back they trust us you know we're affiliated with a, a prestigious university we have partners like the CDC you know, you can't get much more credible than that. 
We all have public health degrees. So, you know, we're not competing to be on camera, to be the stars, to get our names in the lights. We so know our role, and that's what makes it work. And that's why we have the only sustained and systematic program of its kind that I know of anywhere in the world. And it's because of, of these, these lessons learned and this model. Let's do one more, Richard. <clears throat> Two questions, actually. The first is there was uh, a lot of popular media response to programs like CSI uh, that pointed to law enforcement and especially prosecutors being really frustrated because these shows would dilute uh, a fairly complex process into one hour, and they were finding that with, with victims especially, there was a lot of backlash because they were saying, how come you haven't, you know, CSI solves these problems in an hour, how come you haven't been able to you know, pursue this case? Hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if in the, either in the, the post-test or maybe in the way that you talk to the writers, there isn't um, some risk of simplifying some of these, right. these problems to the point that somebody would say, well, you know, I, I may have this or, or this may be an issue. But, but surely I should be able to wrap it up in, in 40 minutes the way that you know, the House does or the VR does. Right. And it's heard that the corollary to that is in the post-tests, it also seems that there's a risk with, uh, you know, when, when you've got the, the media website set up or the, the reaction website set up, that also opens the door for people finding just as many websites that are uh, a little bit less, you know, on the level or, or more sort of in the line of, of you know, pop medical assistance. Right. And they have, uh, I mean, have you found any of that in the evaluations? Those are great questions. And it's interesting, um, I'm, I don't need to talk into this, I keep forgetting. Um, that's one of the, the, your first question about uh, these shortened time frames and somewhat unrealistic framing of issues is a question that's often posed to the writers. We have these panel discussions and members of the audience often ask that. One thing writers, I've heard writers say is, we can guarantee you that the time frames will always be compressed. They'll never be real. So a process that could play out over a year and a half is going to play out in three days you know, on our TV timeline. That's the nature of television. So it is unrealistic. And that's part of it. The thing is, and, and the other part is that what drives the writers, the writers are not um, health educators. They're not educators. They're there to tell compelling stories, compelling dramas, and compelling comedies. So we understand that, and we, we embrace that. We're not trying to get them to be what they're not. And that, you know, I think for people with, say, public health goals, you know, we're used to having these public health campaigns where we actually tell the story the real way, and we have control. We co-produce it, or we produce it, and we have the long time frame, and we show the real outcomes. But when you look at our budgets, we can afford to reach, maybe in a developing country, we can reach a country. But in the US, we might reach a regional group, a state group, a community. May, very rarely can we reach a national audience in the US using a traditional approach. So they're not the same thing. And we can't expect this, a, the, a, a public health campaign result from a TV storyline. It's apples and oranges. So what we do is look at the power of entertainment media, the fact that these episodes, one episode, can reach up to 20 million people in a single hour, and that people, when there are characters that are carried over throughout a season or many seasons, viewers fall in love with them. They see them as members of their family, of, as, as their friends, and they really come to care about what happens to them. And when that happens, they become transported by these storylines, and it creates this incredible openness to learning. And so when we can drop in there, when we can encourage writers to include some accurate health information, and when we can pair that with either a public service announcement, which is our, always our dream come true when it happens, that's aired at a dramatic plot point, and we point them to credible sources of information, we know we're having positive impact. It won't be perfect, because that portrayal won't be perfect. And yes, there are people who use search engines, Google, Yahoo, and they're going to go to whatever site they go to. But we've still done our jobs. We've pointed people to credible sources. We have one coming up soon on um, bipolar disorder among teenagers. It plays out over a six-week period, so it's many segments, many episodes. And, and it's in a show for young people. So we're partnering with the 
uh, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in Washington, D.C. They're setting up a special website. They're putting together special call-in hotline numbers. They're having Spanish and English. They're working with us. It's not going to be perfect, but millions of people are going to see this over weeks. And we're going to be there. They, the network's letting us do a PSA. We're having a lead actor. She's this wonderful character. You know, act in the PSA and refer young people to these resources. It's something, and it's something very powerful. Not perfect, and not a public health campaign, but worthwhile. I think on that uh, wonderful note, if you would join me in uh, once again uh, thanking uh, Sandra de Castro Buffington. And Sandra, we hope uh, you come back. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank uh, Roland, who's sitting uh, behind, uh, who uh, provides us with this beautiful auditorium. Uh, this is the fourth time that we are using it in the past uh, three months. Uh, he opens his heart and uh, does the technology uh, for us. Uh, to Bobby's excellent crew, Laura and Gabby and Lydia, Stan, mm -hmm. and uh, others who uh, help us record these uh, events uh, so that there's a shelf life and we can revisit them. Uh, and of course, to the audience, I see many people who've come back and I see many new faces. And we, of course, encourage you to uh, keep uh, coming back. No, I mean, this is uh, your series. It's not Sandra. Sandra does this work all the time. Uh, uh, but we are privileged indeed that we all can come together to this auditorium. And of course, once again, thanks, Sandra. Yep. And may the informal conversations continue. And uh, thank you all, each one of you, for coming.